All right, we're back at it, moving as quickly as we can through unit seven so we can actually make it to the end of AP World by the time we get to the May 10th exams this year. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about 7.4 and five, the economy in the post-war years, and some of the unresolved tensions that still exist after World War I. Uh, so first, we're gonna focus on economic systems. And what you need to know is that after World War I uh, and the onset of the Great Depression, governments are gonna take a more active role in nation's economic economic lives and individuals' economic lives. And the Soviet Union is going to control its national economy through a series of five-year plans that include repressive policies that are going to have disastrous consequences for Soviet populations. We're going to start with the Great Depression. Uh, the Great Depression was a global economic downturn that began in the United States in 1929 and then spread anywhere in the world, Europe and Asia, especially where countries were doing a lot of international trade and loans with each other. The causes of the Great Depression are many. Just have a couple in your back pocket. Overproduction of agriculture and industry in the United States through the late 1920s. We've got a stock market crash in the United States, a banking crisis around the world as people are trying to pull money out of banks and banks are calling in loans to be repaid. And those banks just don't have the capital on hand. Um, and skyrocketing unemployment, exacerbating all of these economic problems. The responses to the Great Depression are typically going to include governments taking a more active role in shaping their nation's economies. In the United States, this manifests itself uh, initially through, through tariffs passed by the Hoover administration that will fail. Uh, tariffs are a tax on, on foreign goods meant to encourage people to buy more domestic goods. But tariffs in one country often lead to tariffs in other nations. So this just contributed to the economic problems. Um, by uh, 1932, in response to the, the economic crash, we get the election of Franklin Roosevelt in the United States. Roosevelt launched his New Deal policies, a collection of programs aimed at providing relief, recovery, and reform in the United States. Much of this was based on the economist John Maynard Keynes and his economic philosophy of using government spending, deficit spending, money the government didn't really have but could borrow to stimulate economic economy um, in, um, in the country. Uh, it would, um, many of these programs would put people back to work and provide needed aid for Americans, but it wouldn't be until we get to World War II that unemployment in the United States actually returned to pre-depression levels. Over in the Soviet Union, as the economy of the Soviet Union would falter, Vladimir Lenin, that first leader of the Soviet Union, adopted what was called the New Economic Plan. This is like a slow walk towards, towards a communist uh, economy where many aspects of capitalism would still be permitted within the Soviet Union. Remember, the Soviet Union really lacked that functioning middle class. This is turned around though with the death of Lenin and the rise of Joseph Stalin, who wanted to accelerate the Soviet Union's move towards becoming a, a communist industrial power. Uh, two aspects of this are the collectivization of agriculture in the Soviet Union, where individual farms are pooled together uh, to often devastating effects on the population uh, as the government is going to set quotas and, 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 and tell farmers what they need to produce and tell many other farmers that they need to pack their bags and head to an industrial center as that became the main focus of the Soviet economy, that promotion of heavy industry. Now, through the 1930s, this would result in rapid industrialization in the Soviet Union. But remember, they weren't really coming from a very industrialized society to begin with. We're also going to see in the post-World War I and Great Depression years the rise of fascism in Europe. Uh, this starts in, in the 1920s in Italy with Benito Mussolini organizing the first European fascist party. Fascism as an ideology is ultra-nationalist. It's a one-party totalitarian state ruled by a strong man like Mussolini. There's glorification of the military and war. Fascism is expansionist. Uh, fascism is anti-communist as they saw communism as an internationalist um, ideology. By the late 1930s, we will see fascist governments controlling Italy, Germany, and Spain. 
Fascism in Italy comes with the rise to power of Benito Mussolini in 1922. He's going to take Italian frustrations with some of the outcomes of the Paris Peace Conference um, to rise to power um, along with an unstable post-war economy. And he promises to come in and unite a very much divided Italy. In Germany, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party will rise in the early 1930s uh, following the economic crises brought by the Great Depression and feeding on the resentment that Germans feel uh, towards the Treaty of Versailles. And finally, in Spain, uh, we will see a civil war break out in the aftermath of the Great Depression uh, between uh, fascists uh, who are known as the nationalists, led by a man named Francisco Franco, and Republican supporters of the Spanish government. Ultimately, in the end, with some help from Germany and Italy, those fascists are going to win the Spanish Civil War. Now, you also need to be aware as we get into 7.5, uh, between the two world wars, uh, Western uh, and Japanese imperial states will maintain control over colonial holdings or even grow colonial holdings over time while facing some anti-imperial resistance. After World War I, many colonial subjects had hoped that their efforts to help the Allies win the war would lead to their independence. There was a lot of talk about self-determination in the aftermath of World War I. This came up in Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, his list of ideas on how to put the world together after the war. One of them was letting people decide for themselves how they want to be ruled. Unfortunately, this would be offered for, for white Eastern European nations like Poland and Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia, but not for the African and Asian states that were colonized by Britain and France. We will see, however, after World War I, German and Ottoman territories, colonies they held, to be uh, distributed between Britain and France as what we call League of Nations mandates. Now, a little bit on League of Nations mandates. We're not technically calling these colonies, but for all intents and purposes, that's what they are. The League of Nations is going to grant Britain and France these mandates, which is steeped in the notion of a civilizing mission. Basically, that these Middle Eastern and African and some Asian states, they're just not ready to stand up on their own and be their own independent nations. So they had to be controlled and taught by an already industrialized and civilized nation. The Middle East in particular was divided between British and French mandates, with uh, the region of Palestine being under British control. Um, the British during World War I had made a promise to the Jews of, of the world that Palestine could be a national homeland for Jews. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Arab populations were furious at their lack of local control that they believed they were promised during the Second World or during the First World War and the influx of Jews that would be migrating to Palestine in the years after World War I. In South Asia, we're going to start to see a rise of anti-colonial movements. The Indian National Congress will become a strong voice for the independence of India from British control. This grows um, after the 1919 Amritsar massacre, where, where hundreds of Indian nationalists and bystanders will be, will be massacred by, by British officers and soldiers. This is going to foment desire for independence from many South Asians. Mohandas Gandhi, pictured here, is going to become a vocal leader of the Indian nationalist movement through his policy of peaceful resistance uh, and civil disobedience. Uh, he's going to orchestrate boycotts of British goods. Here you can see him uh, spinning his own cloth to make his own clothes, to take back that industry that the British had taken away during the Industrial Revolution. He's going to have to uh, take part in hunger strikes. He's going to hold a salt march uh, to the sea in protest of British trade policies all growing international attention to India. At the same time, Muslim nationalist leaders uh, like Muhammad Ali Jinnah argue for a two-state solution to India, uh, thinking that Indian Muslims need to gain their own territory, which will eventually be known as Pakistan. In East Asia, we see uh, a nationalist revolution in China um, that results in the end of the Qing dynasty. We've already talked about that. Japan will become divided, or Japan sees a divided China as an opportunity for expansion. Since the late 1920s, China is in a long civil war with the communist forces of Mao Zedong and the nationalist forces of Chiang Kai-shek. 
1931, Japan will invade and conquer Manchuria to exploit those resources following the onset of the Great Depression. The new Japanese territory puppet state of Manchukuo, what they called Manchuria, will become a puppet state of the Japanese government and give Japan a foothold in East Asia that they will grow through the rest of the 1930s and into the 1940s, as they claim to be creating the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. Uh, the idea that they were driving out Western influence to bring control back to Asians, but really it was just a Japanese dominated empire. So what do you wanna take the uh, First World War and the Great Depression are each going to lead nations to taking far greater control over their own national economies. The Soviet Union transform itself uh, into a global industrial power through Stalin's five-year plans, and colonialism is expanding for some nations like Japan, Britain, and Germany, while nationalist anti-colonial movements are going to grow in colonial states. We'll see you next time.